Hey, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, title of our study, Paul in Ephesus. I know at least a few of you are thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. We never finished chapter 18. I hope you noticed. And so we are going to do that, but we're going to spend most of our time in chapter 19. So that's, well, that's what we're going to be focusing on. Ephesus, by the way. Just like Corinth that we looked at last time, it's a seaport city. It is thriving. It's commercial. There are about 300,000 people living there. It has a harbor that, well, it's a deep water harbor, but there were problems with it. It would silt up, so they'd have to dredge it out and uh, cause some problems, but they were able to do it. And if you were to come in on one of those ships of the day, you would get off the ship and you would head down to the main street, which, well, it led straight to a 25,000-seat theater. Along the sides, it was 105 feet wide. There were massive rows of columns behind each of those, 50 feet deep on each side. There were shops, gymnasiums, baths, all sorts of other um, attractions of the day. But the real boast of the city was the Temple of Artemis. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. Also called the Temple of Diana, so don't get confused because later he's going to call it that here in the passage. Um, Some called it Artemis, other culture, they're calling it Diana. Same gal, that multi-breasted abomination that's like creepy little thing that they uh, actually have it in the Vatican, which I was kind of surprised when I was in there. I was like, I know it's a museum, but still. In any case, they, they had this mythology that this abomination, although they didn't call her that, they called her a goddess, fell from heaven, sent by Zeus. So they built this magnificent temple to her. Paul's going to have some trouble with that, of course, and they're going to have some trouble with him, but that's just ahead. We read in chapter 18, verse 24, there was a certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandria. Now, that's northern Africa, so he's traveled quite a ways to end up here in Ephesus, and we read of him. He was an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, and he came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Now this is the first of two situations where you have a real disciple, a follower of the true and living God who's waiting for and prepared for the coming of Messiah. He sided with God against himself. That's what the baptism of John would have meant to a a Jew like him. It would be that God says, even though you're my chosen people, even though you have the feast and the festivals and you celebrate and you know me, you still need to be redeemed. You still need forgiveness. And so what they were doing in identifying with John is they were being baptized publicly to say, well, I'm going to go with God. God says I'm still guilty. I'm still a sinner. Yes, I'm loved. Yes, I'm chosen. But I need a savior. So they were being baptized. You know, many were and uh, by John the Baptist himself and then uh, others who followed. Well, Apollos is one of those guys. And he is an excellent example for us of well, how God would have us function as believers. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. That means he was knowledgeable when it came to the scriptures. And we're big on that. We talk about it regularly. We want all of you to read through the Bible. We want all of you to study and be Bereans, making sure you search the scriptures daily, having received them with readiness or clarity of mind. Well, not only is he knowledgeable of the scripture, he's fervent in spirit. He's passionate and on fire. And I think there's something that translates, even when people don't agree with us or aren't sure about us, they know if we're sincere. Now, 
That's not to say just because someone's sincere, they're right. There are a lot of people who are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. And so it's important that you get the first. You're right in the word, and then you're fervent in spirit. And then it said he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. But he only knew the baptism of John. He's not yet born again. And he's preaching and teaching and Aquila and Priscilla show up. There in verse 26b, they heard him and took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, that's not to suggest he wasn't accurate in what he was sharing. He just needed the rest of the story, you see. He needed to know there wasn't just the promise of Messiah. Messiah had come. How he missed that bulletin, I don't know. But now he's being told privately, not publicly, lest there be some kind of debate or discussion. No, they wanted to take him aside. They see his passion for the Lord. They see he's gifted by the Lord. They can see he's serving the Lord. They know he needs to be born again of the Spirit of God. He needs Jesus. He must, as Jesus said, be born again. And so they take him aside. They explain to him the way. Remember that term. It'll come up again. The way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Now, Aquila and Priscilla had taken him aside privately, but now he's talking to people who are publicly saying, Jesus is not the Christ, he's not the Messiah, and he's saying, oh yeah, well let me show you this. And I like what it says he did. He did the very same thing that Jesus did with those disciples on the Emmaus Road. He showed them from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And by the way, at this point, all he has is the Old Testament. So he's going to work through the Pentateuch. He's going to show how Moses wrote of him. He's going to show how the prophets prophesied that he would come and how he'd live and how he'd die and that he'd rise again and that, well, he'd establish a kingdom that would never end. He's going to show that the Psalms spoke of him, as we see in Psalm 22 and other passages that can only, can only make sense if you apply them to the work of Jesus on the cross. Well, in any case, at this point, he... Aquila and Priscilla, they kind of move off the scene. We'll talk more about them in the future. Apollos, we'll talk more about him as well. But at this point, we read in chapter 19, verse 1, that it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Now, Paul had been in Corinth. That's where we were with him last time. And then he'd returned back to Jerusalem and spent some time. He'd gone up to his base of Antioch, and he begins his third missionary journey from there. And so now Paul has traveled, and he finds his way to Ephesus. This is a city where he'll spend a great deal of time, just as he did in Corinth. That wasn't the norm usually, as we know. Run out of town, imprisoned, beaten, stoned, and, uh, but definitely pressed on. But he's going to establish a base as he did in Corinth here in Ephesus. So he passed through the upper regions. He came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, they're disciples of John. We're going to see that in a moment, but I, I want to point something out to you. He begins his discussion with them, not by preaching to them, but by asking a question of them. What it does is it allows them to share where they're at with the Lord. So he knows where to start with them. Some people, you got to go all the way back to Genesis. They say, well, you know, I was taught we evolved. And I'm like, well, not very much. And, uh, but, but, and even if you believe in microevolution, which we see evolution, transition within species, there's never a change from one to the other. Somebody pointed out not that long ago, if, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? I mean, why didn't they all evolve, you see? And if we came from slime, well, why is there still slime? But, but in any case, we'll even come back to that issue. 
But, but Paul comes and he asks them a probing question. I'd encourage you to do the same with people. Jesus did it. He often, go back through his teaching, he often began by asking questions. So he says, hey, did you guys receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And so they said, we've not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now that's a little bit strange because they know the Old Testament and the Spirit, the God, the Holy Spirit is all through it. He comes upon people, he guides people, he anoints and empowers people, but they're saying we don't know about what you're talking about and, and so there's more to all this. But anyway, they just say, well, we haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit and he said, into what then were you baptized? And just like Apollos, it turns out they were baptized into John's baptism. In other words, they heard that Messiah is coming. You need to prepare for the coming of Messiah. You need to repent and be baptized in the baptism of repentance. Now listen, today we don't have a separate baptism for that of repentance and then one for those who are being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as we'll see Jesus instructed us to do, believe and be baptized, repent and be baptized. But, but the point is, it's one thing for us. We turn from our unbelief and trust in him. Or we turn from putting faith in our works or our intentions or our goodness, our righteousness, and we realize I have no acceptable righteousness before God. I have no standing before God unless I'm standing in Christ Jesus, unless I'm clothed in his righteousness. So they say, well, John's baptism. Paul says, John indeed, verse 3, baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. Everybody got that. Now he says that is on Christ Jesus. Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, verses 5 and 6 have presented a lot of doctrinal debate and discussion. So let me be as simple and clear as I can in this. There are some, based on this and one or two other passages, who've come to the conclusion that baptism should be in the name of Jesus only. But here's my problem with that. This isn't saying they didn't use the formula that Jesus gave. It's just saying they had identified with John. Now they identify with Jesus. Jesus is the one who said, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So track with me on this for a minute. Someday, every one of us are going to stand before the Lord. Hopefully you'll be at that first resurrection, that beam of seat of Christ where our works are tested and a whole lot of stuff gets burned up so we don't have to carry it around heaven wearing ourselves out. But, but I, the things that survive, we're going to be rewarded for. But when I stand before God, and I will, and I will give an account for what I taught and how I lived and, and what took place here at Calvary Chico. Well, I'm not going to be able to say, as some will, I wouldn't be so foolish as to say, well, I heard people saying that you were supposed to do it this way, so I gave it a shot. No, listen, Jesus is the one who said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Since I was made by him, since I've been saved by him, since I've been instructed by him, since I'll stand before him in judgment, I want to make sure I'm doing what he said to do. And listen, everyone has a right to their opinion. J. Vernon McGee says it like this. Everyone has a right to be wrong. And people who say it's in Jesus' name only, they're wrong. They just are. Now, I, I, I don't want to be divisive. I'm suggesting that the division is on their part because if Jesus says to do it this way, that's the way we're going to do it. Well, then verse 6, Paul laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke with tongues and prophesied. couple issues have arisen from this. Some have suggested, well, you need someone to lay hands on you if you're going to be filled with the Spirit of God. By the way, when that question was asked, you know, um, you know did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? 
What he's really asking is, were you sealed with the Spirit? Because Paul will later write, if any man has not the Spirit of God, he is not his. Actually, he says, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Romans 8, 9. And so the issue here was, okay, the Spirit of God comes alongside. He's the one who brings conviction. And we've walked down this road, but just a reminder, when you share the Lord... You don't have to convince people. That's the Spirit's job. You don't have to convict them of their sin. That's the Spirit's job. What's our job? We're supposed to speak the truth in love. So as that happens, he brings conviction. And then he's like, there's hope for you. There's forgiveness for you. And and so hearts are opened. And it's God, the Holy Spirit, who had been with who comes in and seals until the day of redemption. That's exactly what Paul will tell the Ephesians later. All our blessings are in Christ Jesus, our righteousness, our acceptance, chosen by him, redeemed by him, sealed by the Spirit of God, who he promised to send, the comforter he said he would send, that he would not leave his own orphans. He would send another just like him well the spirit with us the spirit in us and then the spirit upon us and this idea of the spirit coming upon it's throughout the scriptures the spirit came upon moses the spirit came upon samson the spirit came upon gideon the spirit of god came upon david in the spirit of god when he comes upon a person it's just saying he's anointing and empowering that person to do what would otherwise be impossible for him. We're going to see such a great and clear illustration of this in a moment. That's why I want to lay the foundation. So even if you're familiar with it, stay with me, track with me, the spirit with us, the spirit in us, the spirit upon us. Paul will actually write and say at one point, don't be drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the spirit. What he does is he draws an analogy that everyone could relate to. Drunk with wine, you see it. Person's speech is affected. They stammer and slur and, you know, their speech is just out of it. And then then their walk is affected. They stumble and and fall. And and so he's saying, you don't want to be like that. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Here's why he draws the parallel, connects the dots. When a person is drunk, they're controlled by the wine. When a person is filled with the Spirit, they're controlled by the Holy Spirit. So the issue isn't, as some would suggest, that, well, we need more of the Spirit. You know, like our tank's getting empty and we got to go fill up, you know, on the Holy Spirit so he can overflow us. No, you get all the Holy Spirit you will ever need the moment you give your life to the Lord. But he gets more of you as you grow in the Lord and submit to the Lord. That's what's really happening, you see. So instead of filling myself with wine or anything else that would control me, he says, I need to be filled with the Spirit. And then he says, here's what you'll see happening. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. He says, immediately your speech will be altered. Things you used to say, you'll no longer say. Things you never said before, you'll find yourself saying. Why? Because it's the Spirit of God. Jesus told those first disciples who will be speaking through you. Well, in any case, not just speaking in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That would be declaring the Word of God. But but also making melody in your hearts as unto the Lord. And then he says, submitting to one another in love. Our walk, our way, our attitude, everything changes when the Holy Spirit has control of our lives. Now, there is one more issue. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke with tongues and prophesied. Some want this to say they spoke and prophesied in tongues. That's not what it says. Clearly, it's talking about two different things. They spoke with tongues And they prophesied. When a man speaks in an unknown tongue, Paul tells us, and he means unknown to that man, 
He speaks to God and not to man. So here's what happens. They're saved. They're baptized. They're, they're, uh, Paul lays hands on them. They begin to praise and worship and adore God in a language they'd never known. No. Now that's a notable miracle. But it's not the only miracle. It's not all God did through them or for them because immediately they also begin to prophesy. And that word means to proclaim or declare or herald the word of God. They began to say, thus says the Lord. They put it together and they shared it. And it says the men were about 12 in all. It's important that the the, uh, you know, in all gets in there because otherwise this makes it sound like they're 12-year-olds. But, but no, there were 12 of them. And so, again, he begins with a question. He asks another question, and then he provides the revelation. They're sealed with the Spirit. They're filled with the Spirit. They're worshiping the Lord. They're proclaiming the Lord. Well, all of that leads them to the synagogue or Paul to the synagogue in verse 8 where he spoke boldly for three months reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. This is his well-established pattern at this point. He goes to the synagogue first. He reasons with them. He persuades them. And he got to spend considerable time in this synagogue, much more than in many of them. Sometimes he had one week and the next week he's a goner. And, and so here he is three months, but ultimately what always happened does happen. Some were hardened, they didn't believe, and they spoke evil of the way. It's actually how they referred to Christians in that day. You see, they called them people of the way. And, of course, Jesus says, I am the way. So it makes sense. They're his people, the truth, and the life. Well, they spoke evil of the way before the multitude, so he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus both Jews and Greeks. Now, this is a huge area with a lot of population. And it's saying everybody heard the word. So radical things, given that they had very uh, limited as far as transportation, uh, no media outlets, you know, just some guy on the corner saying, hey, Paul's coming to town, or Paul was just here, and here's what he preached. But... Basically, things we would think that would be great limitations didn't seem to limit them at all. Why? Because they were filled with and operating in the power of the Spirit. And God can do anything through anyone. I want you to see that here. It's in verses 11 and 12. It says, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, miracles by definition are unusual, aren't they? I mean, this is like he's saying these miracles, though, were even unusual for Paul. And he goes on to explain. Even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. A couple of things, and they're majorly important to us today. It says God worked unusual miracles through Paul. It could have said God worked the usual miracles through Paul. But either way, the key words would be God worked, you see. It's God's work. Paul's not a super saint. He's just a guy like us. He, he, he's just someone who loves the Lord and is submitted to the Lord and he's being used mightily by the Lord. And I want you to see it. God's not limited to using a guy like Paul in the first century. There's nothing he did through him he couldn't do through you. Now, will he? I don't know. I don't know what he'll do through you. But I know that your potential isn't limited to your past experiences or your present expectations. It's all about what he wants to do. And if you'll yield and trust and say, Lord, whatever you have for me, here I am. Use me. He worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. 
his handkerchiefs. It really doesn't tell the story. Literally, these are sweatbands. Gives a different picture, you see. If you think handkerchiefs, like he has a little hanky in his, you know, suit pocket. And No, he's making tents. He's a hardworking guy. And he wears this sweatband because to keep the sweat out of his eyes. And so it's more like they were taking your gym clothes and they were giving them to people and they're being healed by them. And when we think like that, we're like, what? I don't want that guy's stinky gym clothes on me. No, the, the, the deal is, and this is why I know God could do anything through us. He was working through handkerchiefs and aprons. I mean, they're inanimate objects. Was this superstition? I don't think so. I think that these people, many of them realize, okay, there's no way to get my sick friend or my sick relative to Paul. There's no way I can get Paul to my sick friend or relative. But if I just could get something that's touched Paul, I bet God will use that. And and, and listen, it was a work of faith. There was no evidence that this would work. They just believed. And God honored that faith because the faith was in his ability to work miraculously. There's another issue here, of course. Paul's working. He takes off his sweatband. He puts it down. He takes off his apron. He sets it down. He goes and gets a drink of water. He comes back and his stuff's gone. It's like, what? This is the fourth sweatband this week. He probably had to work half his time just to replenish his supplies. But, but the issue is that they believed God would work miraculously through objects that came in contact with someone through whom God was working miraculously. And ultimately, it all comes back to God, or it would have been superstitious. It would have been just, well, how could that even be? It only could happen because God was at work. So don't limit yourself. Don't think, well, God's never done anything like that through me, so he never will do anything like that through me. You know, there had to be a first time for Paul that, that he actually prayed for someone to be healed and they were healed. Or he, or he cast out a demon and the demon actually went out. There was a first time for him, just like whatever God does supernaturally, miraculously through us. Well, it will be a first, but it happens. In any case, God worked unusual miracles. Well, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. Now check this out. They know that there's power in the name of Jesus, because they hear Paul saying, in the name of Jesus, come out. In the name of Jesus, be healed. So they're thinking, hey, we want to get in on this. So let's use in Jesus' name or in the name of Jesus and see what happens. Well, if you haven't read ahead, it's exciting. The evil spirit answers and says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? The problem they're having is they're not authorized to use the name of Jesus. And we as believers in Jesus need to be careful that we don't just attach the words in Jesus' name like they were some kind of magic formula to to pray for whatever we want and then we put his name on the end and it's ours. Or we say, hey, in the name of Jesus and then we say what we'd like to see happen. It's never going to be like that. It's all about God getting his work done in us and through us. It's not us. It's him. It wasn't Paul. It's him. It wasn't Peter. It's him. And the evil spirit, and by the way, if you're unaware of this whole area of uh, demonology, the demons are simply angels that fell with Satan. We're told that he took a third of the angels With him when he fell, those angels created by God and for God became demons. And they possess people and they control people and they use people. And we see a powerful example of that in verse 16. The man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now, however you spell failure, this is it. 
Because they're like, come on out. And he's like, no, we're not coming out. I'll tell you what we will do, though, and see it. It's not the demon that jumps the guys. It's the man that jumps them. But he is controlled by the demon forces. Now, sadly, there are some today teaching that, well, Christians can be demon-possessed. I don't believe that to be biblical at all. I don't believe that God, the Holy Spirit, who we're told has taken up residence within us, has sealed us until the day of redemption, is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's us. I don't believe the Holy Spirit is going to share us with any demon. But I do know this. The enemy is a liar and he can still lie to us. He's an intimidator. He can still intimidate. He threatens and he can still threaten. And the better we know the word, the less effective he is. By the way, when it comes to the enemy's lies, if you're an unbeliever, here's what the enemy tells you. You're fine. Don't worry. All this fanaticism about Jesus being the only way. You're a good person. Would God send a good person like you to hell? Listen, God's not sending you to hell. You're picking. You're choosing. You come to the cross. You either say yes and that road that you start on there leads to eternal life in heaven. Or you say no and you end up in hell, but you are the one making the decision. And so here's the issue. The enemy tells the non-Christian, you're going to be fine. So what's he going to tell the Christian? You're such a lousy Christian. I can't believe it. Can You, you lied? Christians aren't supposed to lie? You, you, you said that? You know Christians aren't supposed to talk like that. It's all condemnation, you see. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but he can never have you. All he can do is try to make you unfruitful and impotent in your relationship with the Lord. So you don't reproduce spiritually. So you don't grow spiritually. But when you belong to Jesus, you will always belong to Jesus, and he will never share the throne of your heart with any demonic spirit. Well, all these things, verse 17, became known both to Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all. I guess so. I think if something like that happened around here, people would be like, hey, you don't want to go over there unless you're for real. And you don't want to use in Jesus' name unless you know him and he authorized you to use it. There was fear. There was reverence. There was a sense of awe that God was at work. It says the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. I love that. Those who tried to use it unsuccessfully didn't diminish the power of Jesus' name at all. It just made a clear separation between those who really had him and those who merely professed him. Well, many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds. This is just saying there was a public testimony. People started sharing their testimony. They came and confessed, hey, I was messed up. I was into idolatry. I was into immorality. I was drinking way too much. I was doing this. I was destroying me and my family. But I came to know the Lord, and and here's what he's doing in me. Here's the man he's making me. And so they're coming, and they're confessing, and they're testifying. It's a glorious and wonderful experience to just hear how people have come to the Lord. Last night, I was running a little late, and we got everything set up. I do worship with Rich on on, um, Saturday night, so I had to run out and get some tea and take care of some other business, but uh, TMI, I know. But uh, anyway, I I said, hey, why don't you share your testimony? I was just kind of joking, but I come back in, and he's like sharing his testimony up there. And, and I listened. I actually came and just sat down there. I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. I haven't heard a lot of this. And, and he only shared for a few minutes, but he shared so many important and profound things. I mean, I've known Rich for all of the years I've been here, but I learned some things about him in those few minutes. And I realized, man, it's, we, we need to be doing that. We need to be saying, so how did you come to the Lord? What was happening in your life? How did he first work? What were the major changes that first occurred? Because when, when, when Jesus speaks to this church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, he talks about 
where they were and what they were doing and how proud and blessed he was. And, and, but then he says, but, but I have one thing against you. You've left your first love. And he says, here's the cure for that. If you're going through the motions, you're, you're not doing the bad stuff, you're doing all the right stuff, but you're no longer as fruitful, as joyful, as blessed as you were. You're not the blessing you once were. If that's you, he says, remember. Remember from where you've fallen. Repent. Come back and do the first works. Repeat. That's the third. Remember, repent, and repeat. Do the first works. And so here, here's the thing. These guys, all of a sudden, they're confessing, they're testifying. Many of those who practiced magic, verse 19, brought their books together. They burned them in the sight of all. They counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. He's just saying the good seed of God's word was, was making it into the hearts of men who wanted to change, who wanted to know. And it was blossoming and, and producing fruit, growing. That's his intention. It took root and it produced fruit. When all these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit, verse 21, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent to Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a long time. Now listen. He's purposed in his heart and he's being led, I believe, here of the spirit. He's saying, I got to get back to Jerusalem and I need to make sure I go to Rome. And by the way, both of those are absolutely within the will of God for Paul. What he doesn't know is how all that's going to happen. And I'm thinking that's probably for the best at this point because I've read the rest of the story. See, now... I, I could tell you that Paul's going to go at government expense and you go, well, that's good news. Yeah, but then the, the truth is he was arrested and taken as a prisoner. Well, that's bad news. Well, kind of, but he was on the ship and everyone got saved because he was on the ship. And, and you're like, that's good news. And, and it's like, yeah, but then when they were shipwrecked, he, he was trying to help with the fire and he put his hand out and a serpent got him and everyone just stood and watched him ready to die. And that sounds like bad news and, until you find out, but he doesn't die. And then they're like, whoa, something's really going on here. That's good news. Paul had no idea the how of what God was going to do. He only believed in his heart. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to go to Rome. Jerusalem because, hey, that's the hub and heart of everything spiritually. Rome, that's the hub and heart of everything politically. He wanted to go to the place where everything was emanating from and have an impact there. And he will. People in Caesar's own household will end up giving their lives to the Lord because Paul makes it to Rome. So my point in sharing that with you is that sometimes the Lord shows us what we're going to do and we're like all excited about it and we're anticipating it. And then all of a sudden, all this stuff starts happening. We're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Well, the Lord's having his way. He didn't tell you it was going to be an easy journey. He just said, we're going to get from here to there. I anticipate heaven. I look forward to the day I stand before him in glory. But I have no illusions about the difficulty between here and there. Things only get more dark and more difficult as the years go on. And I'm not talking about just my eyesight fading and, you know, harder because I'm getting older. I'm talking about the days in which we're living until we stand before the Lord well, about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. I mentioned it earlier. I brought it up again. Here it is yet again. People are upset about Paul teaching that Jesus is the way, not a way, not a savior, not a hope, the way, the savior, the hope. And a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. Now, they're making these little 
abominations, that multi-breasted, creepy idol. And again, they think it fell from Zeus and, or, you know, from heaven sent down by Zeus. That's their mythology. That's their superstition. That's what they believe. And they're making a good living making these little shrines, these little idols that they sell to the tourists who come to see the seventh wonder or one of the seven wonders of the world. And it said they, it brought him no small profit. So he gathers together the trade unions, all the people who were of similar occupation. And he says to them in verse 25, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. His first argument is monetary. He's saying, this is going to cost us. And this guy's teaching that these gods we make aren't really gods. Now, that sort of should be a given, shouldn't it? If you make it, it didn't make you. If you made it, it can't save you. doesn't matter what you fashion or what you fashion it from. It is not God. Can't be. By the way, not just the pagans, though. Even God's own people struggle with this. Jeremiah 2, 27, let me read it to you. Well, I'm not going to read it to you. I'll just give you the heart of it. He says, they say to a tree, Daddy, and to a stone, mommy they're they're looking at trees and stones and they're making stuff out of them and then they're saying you made me i'm your offspring like the children of israel who fashioned that golden calf and after they made it they say this is the god that brought us out of bondage in egypt really how did he do that you're already out it's just crazy we can see the insanity of worshiping anything you've made and worship of anything but the true and living God he calls sin he calls idolatry Psalm 115 points out the foolishness of making an idol that has eyes and ears and a mouth and hands but it can't see or hear or speak or handle and he says those who make them are like them so is everyone who puts his trust in them What does that mean? It's saying the person who makes an idol becomes like that idol or is giving evidence that he's deaf, dumb, and blind spiritually, even as that idol can't do anything. Now, when they heard this, oh, verse 27, I can't skip it. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, But also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. He's saying, listen, this is going to impact us and is monetarily. Once more, spiritually, we're in real trouble here because, well, we have the temple and we have the idol. We have her and we all know she's goddess. She's a god. Well, when they heard this, they were full of wrath. And they cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. But she didn't hear it at all, you see. So the whole city filled with confusion and the enemy loves this. God is not the author of confusion. The enemy loves chaos and confusion because he just works so well in that chaos. They rushed into the theater. This is that 25,000 seat theater. They rush in with one accord. Having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. And some of the officials of Asia who were his friends sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another for the assembly was confused. And most of them did not know why they'd come together. It's like they just hear the noise. They head down there. Everybody's shouting and stuff. They're like, why are we here again? Well, I don't know. Why? I thought you knew. And it's like nobody knows what's going on. That's what a mob does, you see. Just creates this whole chaos and confusion. And by the way, if you're younger and you see something intense like this, you probably are attracted toward it. When you're older and wiser, I see a mob scene starting. I'm always headed the other direction. 
When we were in Rome, we saw this gathering and all these people were starting to come around and I'm like, let's get out of here. And, and, and uh, there was another time we were by the Colosseum and I was teaching right outside of it and, and uh, all these people were with us. I mean, we had 450 people with us, so we're pretty much a mob, but they're not all shouting, they're all listening. And all of a sudden the police show up and there's multiples of them and, and they thought it was going to become something ugly because that happens regularly around there and and so it turned out that our guides were able to fend them off and we have some great video at those you see the video of me teaching and then you goes over you know and it's the cops and it's people are like oh you know don't do it don't stop them and and so the the, the point is this is an out of control situation and scene and they they don't even know why they're there so they draw alexander out of the multitude, the Jews put him forward. Here's a guy who can represent. And he motions with his hand. He wants to make his defense to the people. But when they found out he was a Jew, all with one voice, they cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now listen, I don't know how mindless you have to be to do anything for two hours, but, but two hours of just saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians, I'd be worn out and ready to go in like 10 seconds. But in any case, that's what's happening. So we get a feel for the scene. Finally, the city clerk quiets the crowd. And he says, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, You ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. Two thoughts, and then we'll read the last couple verses and worship together. Since these things cannot be denied, we all know it to be true. Science has proven whenever anyone is dogmatic like that, and they're outside of the truth of scriptures, listen, Today, men say this about evolution. In our schools, they teach that evolution is proven. It's a fact. It's scientific. But it can never be proven by the scientific method. It is just an idea. And not a very good one, by the way. Men say, we know for a fact, just as he's saying here, these things cannot be denied. And God says, oh, yeah, well, in the beginning, I created the heavens and the earth. And just as I shared earlier, if men say one thing and God says another, well, I'll go with God. I think he knows what he did. He knows how we got here. I already mentioned it, didn't I? If we evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? I mean, clearly they're going to catch up later, right? What will we be then? But in any case, it doesn't matter what the issue, global warning, Global warming, yeah, that's what we need is a global warning. But global warming, they don't call it that anymore, do they? What is it called now? Climate change. Hey, that's happening for sure. The question is, is it man-made or not? And I got to be honest, I can't know that, but I do know this. God is in control of nature. Absolutely, 100%. Jesus could say to the storm, be stilled, and it was stilled. God could say, I'm going to shut up heaven and there'll be no rain until I cause it to rain. So God is in control. By the way, when we talk about men being responsible for nature, are we responsible for the seasons? Are we the reason there's spring and then there's summer and then there's fall and then there's winter? No, that was happening before we were here and it will keep happening after we're gone. The issue here is God is in control of all his creation. Now, if we want to take responsibility for global warming or, you know, climate change, let's deal with Harris Ranch. Cow flatulence, it's been proven. It is putting all sorts of gases into the air. You can smell it when you're down there. But the problem is we can say, I think, and, and, and God would say, okay, well, you're ignorant. But, but these people aren't saying, I think. They're saying these things cannot be denied. These things are absolutely true. These things were all in agreement. All scientists agree. And here's the thing. 
It's completely ridiculous to be dogmatic like that. No, I understand those who would hear me, who disagree with me, and say, well, you're doing exactly what you say they're not supposed to do. Here's the difference. I'm right. And so when you know something's true, you're supposed to be dogmatic about it. You're not supposed to be wishy-washy. You're not supposed to say, well, maybe there's some. No. Truth is truth. Light is light. Absolutes are just that. Well, this guy, in spite of the fact that he says these things can't be denied, actually has some good counsel alongside of it. So it shows even a fool can give you some insight. He says you ought to be quiet. And I think if people are saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians, they ought to shut up. And, and then... Do nothing rashly. Think through, he's saying, the consequences of what you're doing. For you've brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples or blasphemers of your goddess. And if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open. There are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar, there being no reason that we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he said these things, he dismissed the assembly. It all began with Apollos preaching and teaching, empowered, passionate, knowledgeable, but he needed to know Jesus. And Aquila and Priscilla made sure he got that introduction. Then Paul shows up and he meets these guys who were disciples as well. It reminds me that just because someone doesn't know Jesus, it doesn't mean they don't have a love for God or a passion for God or that they aren't on the right track. They just need to know. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That no one will come to the Father but by him. Lord, thank you for creating us. And Lord, we know you created us on purpose and with purpose. That we're not an accident. We're not the product of evolution. You made us for yourself. So the world that is ignorant of you or hears and rebels against you. They're missing the very purpose of their creation. They will never understand why they're here. But we know we're here to know you, to love you, to love one another, to love the world around, to be a light in a world that so desperately needs to know that you are the light of the world, that you are the resurrection and the life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. So I pray, Lord, that we'll bring that message, that we'll share our testimony, that we'll go back to the time where we first believed, that we'll remember and repent and repeat those first works. And Lord, I pray for any and all here today, this service, this hour, this moment, who aren't sure about where they're at with you. They've believed on you. They knew there'd be a Savior. And the question becomes, have they received your spirit having believed? And if you're here and you've grown up in the church or around it and you've always believed that Jesus is the Lord, but you have never said, Jesus, be my Lord. Come into my heart. Save me from my sin. Not just its consequence, its power. Transform my life. You know if none of that's happened. And so if you want to give your life to him right now, while every head's bowed, every eye's closed, every Christian's praying, because they've been right where you are. They know the decision you're faced with, and you will make a decision today. You'll decide for the Lord, or you'll decide against the Lord. And if you're like, no, I'm not making that. I just want more time to think. Well, I, I would take as much as you need, but I would make it as soon as possible, because no man can keep his soul alive. None of us have a promise of tomorrow, and you will stand before God someday. And here either, well done and enter in or depart from me. You want to hear the first and not the last. If you've never given your life to him, I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high. I'll pray for you and with you and you will be born again. You will be forgiven every sin. Anyone this hour, anyone this service, God bless you here in the front. Awesome. 
Anybody else want to join this brother and say, me too, me too, right now. I don't want to go one more moment without a relationship with you. Anybody else before we pray? You who've raised your hand, want you to pray these words aloud after me. Anyone else who wants to pray, pray along and pray aloud. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me, for drawing me, for convicting me of my sin, convincing me of your love. Thank you most of all for sending Jesus who died for my sins, was buried and rose again. He gave his life for me, so I give my life to you for now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. 